part one, course information. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Hello, I wonder if you could help me. I am interested in enrolling in your MBA program. Could you give me some information, please? Yes, of course. I'll take a few details first of all, and I'll give you a copy of our prospectus. Oh, that's okay. I already have one here. I've been researching the MBA courses in the local area, so I already have lots of course information. That's great. Okay, so first of all, can you tell me your name, please? Yes, of course. It's Anne Horbury. Horbury is that H A W B E R R Y? Yes, that's right. Okay, and what's your date of birth, Miss Horbury? The twenty second of May, nineteen eighty one. That's great. And you were born in the UK? Yes, I was. All right. Can you give me some contact details, please? Sure. My address is twenty six Simon Place in Brighton. And my telephone number is o one nine o three seven one four seven two one. Sorry, can you tell me your contact number once again? Yes, it's o one nine o three seven one four seven two one. Okay, great. And do you have a mobile phone number? No, I don't. Is it important? No, that's okay. I'll just write it on your form. No mobile phone. Now, just a few additional questions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Are you working or studying anywhere else at the moment? Yes, I'm working for Lloyd Enterprise in the city as a secretary, and I'm also attending a computer course part time in the evenings. Great. So, can you give me some details about your educational background? We need to make sure that your qualifications match the entry requirements. Yes. I completed a business degree a year ago. I've been working since my graduation, but the job market is very competitive these days. So I'd like to do some postgraduate study now. Okay, that sounds fine. Your degree is relevant, and it's good that you have some work experience too. I do need to warn you, though, that our MBA program is extremely popular and gets full quickly. So, would you be interested in applying for any alternative courses if your application is not successful this time? Well, my first choice would, of course, be the MBA. But yes, I've had a good look through your prospectus, and I would also be interested in the international marketing course. That's great. It's always a good idea to keep your options open just in case. Finally, can you tell me where you learned about our courses here? Actually, my cousin studied the MBA course two years ago, and she recommended it to me. Okay, well, thank you for coming in today. I will pass your details on to our admissions department. They should contact you this week with a formal application form, and they usually invite MBA candidates to come in for an interview. Okay, well, thanks for your time. No problem. Good luck with your application. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear a talk about making the most of graduate school. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Entrance to the graduate school. My job now is to give you the graduate school survival guide and make some concise suggestions for getting the most out of your relationship with our research supervisor, getting the most out of what you read, and making continual progress with your research. First, your relationship with your supervisor. This is fundamental. Meet regularly. You should expect to meet once a week or at least every other week because this will give you the motivation to make progress and also keeps your advisor aware of your work. Prepare for your meetings. Come to each meeting. Also, bring the notes from your previous meeting together with a list of any upcoming deadlines. Make a plan for what you hope to get out of each meeting. After the meeting, email your supervisor a brief summary. Include a list of major topics discussed, a list of what you agreed on, a note of any advice you may not want to follow, and a new summary of what you are planning to do. This helps avoid misunderstandings and provides a handy record of the progress of your research. Add a to-do list for yourself and your supervisor, including a reading list. Finally, add the time and date for the next meeting. My second main piece of advice is to keep your supervisor informed. Show him or her the results of your work as soon as possible. This helps your supervisor understand your research and identify any potential points of conflict early in the process. Include summaries of your work, including any results of experiments, and also anything you write about your research. Thirdly, communicate clearly. If you disagree with your advisor, state your objections and concerns clearly and calmly. If you feel that something about your relationship is not working, discuss it with him or her. Whenever possible, suggest steps that they could take to address your concerns. Under this heading, it is extremely important to take the initiative. You do not need to clear everything you do in your research with your advisor. He or she is busy too. You must be responsible for your own ideas and the progress of your work. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. The second section of my talk is about getting the most out of what you read. The first principle here is to be organized. Keep an electronic bibliography with notes and pointers to the paper files. Keep and file all the papers you have read. Point two, be efficient. Only read what you need to. Start by reading only the conclusion, scanning figures and tables, and looking at their references. Read the other sections only if the paper seems relevant or you think it might help you get a different perspective. Skip the sections you think you already understand. These are often the background and motivation sections. 
It's of critical importance to take good notes on every paper you find worth reading. Note especially what problem the author is trying to solve, what approach they take to the problem, and how their approach differs from other approaches. Next, summarize what you have read on each topic. After you have read several papers on the same topic, note the key problems, the various formulations of the problem under consideration, the relationship between the various approaches and the alternative approaches you come across. Let me add one point you might not have already thought of. Read PhD theses. Even though they are long, they can be very helpful for quickly learning about what has been done in your field of interest. Focus particularly on the background sections and method sections. Don't forget to read your advisor's thesis. This will give you an idea of what he or she expects from you. The third section of my talk is about making continual progress with your research. Keep a journal of your ideas. Write down every issue you are thinking about, even if you think it is stupid. This will help you keep track of your progress and keep you from going round in circles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear part of a lecture on some useful information for your travelling around Britain. Listen to the lecture and complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty one to twenty five. Good afternoon and welcome to the session on Britain. This afternoon I would like to provide some useful information for you about travelling around Britain. Britain has over seven hundred tourist information centres. You will find them at major ports, airports, stations, historic landmarks and towns and holiday centres. So just look out for this sign that says tourist information. The staff will be able to answer your holiday queries as well as provide essential maps, guides and brochures. Tourist information centres at major ports and airports in London and addresses of British Tourist Authority European offices are all listed on the tourist information centres. Now, let's talk about the telephone in Britain. You know, Britain is well supplied with public telephones. Street kiosks take lop coins. In city centres, mainline railway stations, airports and central London underground stations. Payphones and card phones are in operation. For the latter, small plastic phone cards are used and these come in 10, 20, 40, 100 and 200 units and can be bought at post offices, news kiosks, station bars and shops where the green and white card phone sign is displayed. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. When using the different public telephone systems, make sure you read the dialing instructions carefully. Now let's see the banks in Britain. There are 24-hour banks at London's two main airports. One is Heathrow and the other is Gatwick. Otherwise, banks are normally open from 9.30 to 3.30, Monday to Friday. Barclays Bank and National Westminster Bank offer a Saturday morning service at some of their branches. National Gyrobanks has 42 bureaux de change located in post offices throughout the country in main tourist areas. Opening hours are 9 to 5.30 weekdays, 9 to 12.30 Saturday mornings. One exception to this is the Trafalgar Square office, whose opening hours are 8 to 8 weekdays and Saturdays, and 10 to 5 on Sundays. The Bureau de Change services are available to overseas visitors. Visitors can change their money there. You can also change money at Bureau de Change, large hotels, department stores and travel agents. Be sure to check in advance the rate of exchange and the commission charged, as these vary considerably. Wherever possible, you are advised to use the bank or Bureau de Change, which conforms to the BTA Code of Conduct. In most cases, this is indicated by display of the code. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an environmental studies student giving a presentation about his project on saving an endangered species of plant. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. For my presentation, I'm going to summarize what I've found out about efforts to save one plant species, the juniper bush. It once flourished in Britain and throughout the world's temperate zones, but over the last few decades has declined considerably. Before I go on to explain the steps being taken to save it in England, let me start by looking at some background information and why the juniper has been so important in cultural as well as ecological terms, historically and in the present day. Firstly, I want to emphasise the fact that juniper is a very ancient plant. It has been discovered that it was actually amongst the first species of plants to establish itself in Britain in the period following the most recent Ice Age. And, as I say, it has a much-valued place in British culture. It was used widely as a fuel during the Middle Ages because when burnt, the smoke given off is all but invisible and so any illicit activities involving fire could go on without being detected. For example, cooking game hunted illegally. It also has valuable medicinal properties. Particularly during large epidemics, oils were extracted from the juniper wood and sprayed in the air to try to prevent the spread of infection in hospital wards. And these days, perhaps its most well-known use is in cuisine, cooking, where its berries are a much-valued ingredient used to flavour a variety of meat dishes and also drinks. Turning now to ecological issues, juniper bushes play an important role in supporting other living things. 
If juniper bushes are wiped out, this would radically affect many different insect and also fungus species. We simply cannot afford to let this species die out. So, why is the juniper plant declining at such a rapid rate? Well, a survey conducted in the north and west of Britain in 2004-5 to showed that a major problem is the fact that in present-day populations, ratios between the sexes are unbalanced and without a proper mix of male and female, bushes don't get pollinated. Also, the survey found that in a lot of these populations, the plants are the same age, so this means that bushes grow old and start to die at similar times, leading to swift extinction of whole populations. Now, the charity Plant Life is trying to do something to halt the decline in juniper species. It's currently trying out two new major salvage techniques, this time focusing on lowland regions of England. The first thing it's trying is to provide shelters for the seedlings in areas where juniper populations are fairly well established. These, of course, are designed to help protect the plants at their most vulnerable stage. A further measure is that in areas where colonies have all but died out, numbers are being bolstered by the planting of cuttings which have been taken from healthy bushes elsewhere. Now, I hope I've given a clear picture of the problems facing this culturally and ecologically valuable plant and of the measures being taken by plant life to tackle them. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.